Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pioneering Pensions. For those who don't know me, my name is Stefan Lundberg, and I have a passion for pensions. Today is a bit different because I'm calling to you from Toronto in Canada. That's why you have the hotel room background. And today we have an amazing guest on the same continent, and that's Joe Pilger. Joe has an amazing background. I know him for many, many years. We met and chatted in Australia a couple of times, but also across the world. I think Joe, he has seen more than most people about different pension systems across the world. And therefore, we'll talk a lot about the international trends. Joe is uh, global head of global pension and retirement in, in Ernst & Young. And he covers both administration and investments when it comes to his expertise, which is quite unique. And with him, we're going to see and discuss the different challenges that we see as pension funds and what are the things we see in the world, what, what can we learn from other places. So this is going to be a true journey into seeing how the world looks like. So, Joe, with that, I wish you very welcome to Pioneer Pension. And... Uh, yeah, let's shoot the first question. So when it comes to the technical aspects of pension across the world, I think most of us can say, well, the technical part is quite similar. It's the same solution, pool and longevity or not. And when you're thinking about it, what is the big difference? And Joe, you have worked with different organizations across the world. Would it be fair to say that mm -hmm. culture culture around pension is the main differentiator? It's a good question. As a, as a good, good consultant, let me start with a disclaimer, because I'm here as an individual, whatever, whatever I'm saying is my personal opinion only. Now get, get the, the compliance out of, out of the way. I think it's a really good, good question, Stefan. I think to me, when I look at, at this, I think there are two components. One is culture, and I think we can talk about that, that in more detail. I think the second part is context. And we'll, we'll talk, talk a little bit about that as well, socioeconomic context, where you are in, in, in the maturity, where, where you are in the demo, demographics. So I think this, th those are, are really the two key differentiators in my view. Everything else boils down to about 100 or so, or so different parameters. And yes, individual organizations are, have, have their levers at different spots, but the levers are, are pretty similar across the world, across the DB, D, D, DC, and hybrid CDC, however you want to, want to call those solutions, very, very similar across the world. With the cultural differences, does it also come back in the sort of decision making within pension organizations? You know, when, when you look at cultures, I've done a little bit of, of, of psychology in, in, in my, my younger years. So this whole behavioral, behavioral and psychology part, part to me is fascinating. But when you look at what culture is, in very simple terms. It's a set of beliefs, norms, and values. And they essentially determine what we pay attention to, how we make decisions, what's important to us. And that translates back into all the decisions that each of the individual stakeholder and stakeholder groups are making. Whether it's an employer, whether it's an employee, whether it's a government, government organization. And I think when you actually look at it, that maybe in, in, in that, that order, looking at the different stakeholders, we talk a lot about struggling with financial literacy. We, we talk a lot about struggles in certain countries with, with embracing annuities or decumulation products. It all boils down to, to what's your individual country-specific investment belief? What's your heritage? How, what have you experienced in the past? And having grown up in, in post-war Germany myself, but moved to Australia uh, and, and now living in the US, you can see very clearly a place like Germany is struggling with the opposite to Australia. Australia is struggling with embracing, and we'll come back to that later on, the annuity component, where Germany is struggling struggling at, at, at the moment is in, in actually getting and embracing more the investment investment risk risk element. So very, very, very important for, for, for the, the employees. And let me give, give you a very sim simple case study that I've recently heard. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting study that was done with Asian American girls. And there are some very stereotypic uh, uh, perceptions out there 
that girls are, are worse at, at math, but Asians are good at math. So what, what people have done is some, some, some very, very smart psychologists have, have done studies with different level of priming. And they, in a subtle way, appeal to you as a girl in, in, in some cases, and in other cases, they appeal to you as being an Asian. And the fascinating thing is, is that they come to fundamentally different success rates of doing math studies and math exams. So it's, it's not only uh, Im implicating and, and impacting our biggest, bigger perceptions, but it also Im implicates how we as, as individuals make decisions here and now in individual spots, depending on how we're going to be fine. When people impose things on you, it's very difficult to break them all. I, I spent quite some time working in the Netherlands and you're from Germany. And I think the culture in the two countries, which is basically neighboring, has the uh, same geographic uh, starting point. They should be quite similar, but the culture is quite different when it comes to decision making, for example. Yeah, when, when you look, look back, I said, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on, 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 the, on the Dutch culture, but I've worked enough, enough with, with people in, in, in this space. I think there's some interesting cultural elements in here. When you look at, uh, there's, there's a couple of parameters that sort of, of influence culture that experts are, are focusing on. And one, for example, is power gradient. What is the likelihood of you challenging your boss uh, or challenging and, and, and driving these discussions? The Dutch have, have the lowest power, power gradient, aka they're very, very comfortable to engage in a very, very open dialogue, debate, fierce interactions to drive the best outcomes. On the German side, it's, it's, it's far, far more, more formal, far, far more, more systematic, but both have, have one element in common. They debate a lot. And some, some people, partic particularly on, on, in an Anglo-Saxon environment, can get frustrated. But once they debate, they make a decision with a capital D, aka that decision stands. And in this process of debate and deliberation, people have actually gotten on board. So the implementation period is usually faster and easier. Where a lot of, of, of for example, on the Anglo-Saxon side, and we'll come back to that, that later on, people make a lot of decisions faster, but decisions with a small d, aka those decisions will be changed tomorrow. And it takes similarly long to, to the Dutch and the Germans to actually deliberate and then implement. But those are very, very simple cultural, cultural norms that are different between, between both of those, of, of those countries. That technically, they're, they're very, very close to each other but have fundamentally different history uh, and, and therefore the, the, the cultural is just nuanced difference. And I'm thinking you, you mentioned also the Anglo-Saxon culture and that's like the elephant in the room. Now, when it comes to pension, you have the, in the Anglo-Saxon model, it's more like the individual have to take responsibility. You put a lot of responsibility on the individual and more the, the Dutch Nordic model is to say, well, it's more paternalistic and say we're going to take care of you it's not a lot of decision the individual can make and have have you probably seen variation of this across the world but based on your experience what do you think is the better of the two models <laughs> i think that, that's that's separate between theory and practice i think in in, in theory and before we delve into this i think we have a, as human beings have a natural in instinct to separate, to, to create us and them, DB versus DC, uh, paternalism versus individualism. And in my pers personal experience, in, in, any of these models can work if you have the parameters set right. That's a theory. So I've seen very, very successful defined benefits models. The Netherlands have, 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 have done that. The Canadians have done a pretty good job, job in, in their DC. And we, and, and we have other, other places like Singapore and others who've done a good model in, in this space. What people very, very often forget is that you look at different set, set, sets of, of, of parameters. And unfortunately, most organizations don't necessarily look at all the different levers and setting the levers right to consistently go from A to Z and implementing the necessity or the necessary models for individuals to, to make choices. 
and therefore we have a lot of bad choices or people are not not in, in, engaging let me come back i've, I've, I've recently did, did, a, did a study for for the ifc part of the world bank group uh where we, we were asked to look at and it's it's a public report out there so i can freely talk about it but there is a set of parameters that we, 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 we define to determine the success of countries and providers, not individuals, on, 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 on success. And it's really fascinating when, 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 you, when you look at these parameters, and as I mentioned, very, very few people, very, very few countries go to implement from A to Z. And when I look at some of the positive things here, for example, Australia, Australia has made a couple of very, very clever decisions. We'll come back to that later on. But one of the key decisions is mandating, mandating contributions. And that has solved one problem, participation. Participation is solved. And we'll come later on, uh, talk, talk about, about some other issues that, that, that you have uh, in, 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 in this regard. But when you think about, for example, the United States, they have not really gone down the mandatory road. It's a very, very nasty political word to talk about M. Um, and, and, and therefore, they're struggling, struggling with, with, with many, many of, of these elements. So trying to answer your question very simplistically, in theory, there is no difference between any, any of those models if they're implemented from A to Z properly. Unfortunately, that's rarely the case. And with that, I, I know that you, you typically United Kingdom as an example of doing policy that is not straight from A to Z. And I think you call it a bit of bumblebee management by bumblebee or something like that. C could you sort of explain that expression? Because I like it. It's kind of colorful and uh, gets you to think. I've been watching and being involved in projects in, 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 in this space with the UK for about 30 years. And I think when you look at it, the country has made some really, really interesting progress in, in particular areas and when i personally look at that it, it initially the assessment and then later on led, led to to nest is in my humble view still one of the best in the, in the world in terms of really systematically assessing what needs to be done but what i see see quite quite often is the country in, in my personal view when when you look at examples like the retail distribution review nest and auto enrollment the pension dashboard having multiple regulators. All of this is essentially is a flower. The bumblebee jumps on the flower, AKA a particular problem, and they solve that. And to, to, in, in, in most of those cases, they solve it reasonably well. But then one, once it's sort of, of solved to a certain level, the bumblebee flies to the next flower. Unfortunately, as an individual, it's, it, it, it's not, not a, a set of, of flowers. It essentially needs to be a co cohesive, system and what i see quite often it's very hard as an external person to understand what is the connectivity between those flowers what is the big picture the vision what is the long-term plan and i think the, the the rationale that i see quite often in most countries around the world that long-term plan does not exist for two reasons one is people actually don't define clearly what does success of the system mean? Not in today, tomorrow, but what, the, what is the strategy, the vision, the objectives of an organization and the system for the next 30, 50, 100 years? And then the second part is politics. So as a, as a political leader, you jump on this, and I think that's where probably the bumblebee component comes from, because the, 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 the politicians determine that one particular bumblebee, aka a particular problem, is giving them enough boost politically that, that they should solve this. Yeah, I think that, that sounds familiar for most places, actually. Uh, I was thinking our previous guest, Derek Dobson, he had a relation, uh, question related to this and uh, how to kind of make a better system when it comes to pensions. But instead of me repeating that question, let's roll the tape. Given that our current self needs versus our future self needs are quite different and we tend to focus on our current self should participation in pension programs be made mandatory across the different uh, schemes of course that is different based on whether your pillar one your government programs are quite robust 
it's not as important. But in Canada, the pillar one systems are basically just anti-poverty measures. So that would be my big question would be, should pension programs be workplace pension programs be made mandatory? I think it's a great question. Let's give, let me give you probably three answers. Now, number one, as I mentioned earlier, I think in theory, all the systems, if you implement them properly from A to Z, should deliver this, the same outcomes. Unfortunately, that theory, because very, very, very rarely companies and countries do that. And therefore, I think those countries who've actually introduced mandation, I think that's my, my, my second point, have been faring substantially better. Look, look, look at Australia, look at Singapore, where participation is not a big deal because they have sol solved the problem. But my third point is, when we look at what does participation actually solve, and when you look at, at the, the actual decision stages during a, a, a person's life, participating in a system, and we've seen this in Australia, has solved the first problem, to engage, to make an informed decision on participating, and to some degree even should I contribute. It does not address empowering me to actually make long-term decisions. It does not help me, and you see this at, at, at the moment in a place like Australia where there's the country and individual struggle because they've not been adequately enabled to make long-term informed decisions about decumulation and retirement. And when, when, when you look at that second component is mandatory participation does not help automatically with the actual fo focus on, on, on this. So I think we be, being able to go, in, in my view, probably four steps further, or have five, five components when, when it comes to, to, to really focusing on, on, on mandatory considerations. One is the actual participation. And that, in, in my humble view, is when I look at, conversely, all those systems that are completely voluntary, I can't point you to any of, of them that have actually achieved its participation goals. And even in, in the mighty United States, where uh, 401ks have been around for, for more than 40 years, it has taken a ton of time to get to, and depending on, on your ask, you, get, you get, get a different number, but about 50 million Americans don't have, have 401k and don't have 401k access. So be, as, as, as a consequence, I think, the mandatory participation is def definitely a, a big advantage. Now, the, the next best that we see is auto-involvement style, style, style features. I think that's, that's participation. I think the second part that I would make somewhat mandatory or, or focused is on enabling me to make informed decisions. And what you've seen very, very clearly, the UK had mandatory annuitization until about, I think, 2013. People had to, to, to annuitize a certain percentage. When they abolished this, a lot of people made very, very silly decisions with their money. So to me, this enablement function is very, very, very important. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody needs to, to, to make an informed decision uh, in, 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 in this. So def that's why you have good defaults. But I think to me that enablement function for the majority of people is, is, is important. I think there's an element in there as, as well that goes hand in glove, and that is for those who want to choose, is some level of quality of advice, enabling them with financial advice, because it's not just about retirement, it's also about healthcare, it's about requesting, it's about your lifestyle, health insurance, and, 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 and other elements, financial decisions, being able to, to pay for your student debt, and, and other aspects. So quality of advice, in my view, is, is, a, is, a, is a key element. Then there is, to me, two additional elements. One is governance. And what governance means in very simple terms is trust. So to what degree do these systems need to have a beefed up governance with teeth? And then the last point is, is to me, what I mentioned earlier on, is there needs to be a long-term vision so that people who are mandated into a system have a very, very, very clear perspective. Because one of the things that we've learned as part of this project that, that I mentioned earlier is to manage my expectations. My expectations when I start 
how much am I likely to get out? Are you going to solve all my financial problems in 30, 40 years from now? And we see this particularly in middle income countries where the, the rapid growth of, 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 of their income may sometimes even with full mandation, full participation, only lead to 20, 30, 40% of, of replacement rate, very simply because for the, for the first 20 years of, of, of people's contributions, their salary is smaller. So I think those are, are, are to me, the, the five key components where I'd say mandatory makes sense. But let me make one final point. The word M is politics. Because mandatory is works in certain countries. I think in certain countries you can't even use the word M. So any 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 mentioning of mandates here in the United States, you get shot down very quickly. And it takes a very, very brave political environment to be able to push mandates through. So to me, as much as I'm a big fan of what Australia has done with the mandation, I'm not sure that today such a decision will be made yet again. Yeah, it's um, the development is basically margins of previous decisions, right? So. It, it leads you to where you are. But I like the approach to say mandatory could solve the big problem that people actually are saving, but then you need to figure out how you're going to help them when they enter towards using the money later on. I was thinking also, you, you mentioned Australia quite some couple of times. If you would kind of quickly, since you spend a lot of time in Australia and all the system inside out, you could say what is sort of the... The case study of Australia, and let's focus on the pension admin side, not the investment side. Mm -hmm. What is the stuff you can learn from Australia? What is the ecosystem? How does it work? And what are the lessons, good and bad? Yep. Let, let, let me point, point out maybe maybe five different components. One is, I think, Australia, the decision to mandate more than 30 years ago is one of the, or the best decision because it solved the participation problem. I think the introduction of choice and choice of provider has really helped to give people a little bit more, more the feeling that in this supposedly straitjacket of mandation, they have flexibility. So they have some level of, of control. So that to me was, was a very clever, clever second point. The third point is very similar to all the findings that came out of Nest many, many years ago. Australia followed their path to initially start, I think, with 3%. So it was not painful. Now it's it's going up, and I think there's some debates to increase it up to 15%. Uh, but I think what has had, had has really helped dramatically that people slowly increase and gradually increase. I think there's there there's, is one additional point that is depending on on the perspective, good or bad, and that is is I had the pleasure to sit on a government committee about a decade ago to help introduce standards standards to interact between the employers and the providers to essentially transmit data and money. And that was a process that was sort of forced upon the, uh, the, the industry by, by the government, led by the tax office. They've done a tremendous job in my view. But what it has, has, has driven and led to is actually the introduction of, of efficiency, of, of, of innovation, because beforehand, it, it was reasonably cumbersome to transmit money and data from the employers across to, to the funds. And that has actually led to a number of very, very innovative organizations. So I think I'll, I'll let you decide whether, whether that is a good or a bad thing, because uh, I'm sure the industry at the time didn't, didn't feel, feel that was a good thing at, at, at all. And I think similarly, and we can talk a little bit about that, that, that uh, in, in, in more detail, is on the financial advice space. I think that's been a, a, a journey where initially the advice space was focused on high net worth individuals, like in most countries. Once superannuation of retirement pension balances were growing, more advisors were paying attention to, to, to this segment, segment as well. And it led to, to the growth of investment platforms, highly, highly sophisticated platforms. But up to a point, up to 60% of, of a provider, platform owner's products were sort of advised through those, through those 
to, to you as an individual. So yes, you were supposed to be receiving independent advice, which you have, but you ended up with 60% of one provider's products, uh, which sort of, of then raised big, big questions around, very similar to what the UK has done with their retail distribution review on quality of advice. The country introduced an interesting measure called, called personal advice. So Australia does not have what the UK has in terms of money guidance. They, they do have these a little bit as well, but not as, as, as widespread as the UK and institutionalized. But the personal advice was supposed to solve some, some of these. But then, unfortunately, Australia had its retail distribution review in, including it into superannuation and a number of, of um, bad behavior was uncovered which essentially led, led to, to about 60%, 50% of, of the entire advice industry disappearing because it was too hard, too hard to, to, to maintain. The country is now in big, big, big strides to realize maybe they have gone too far. People need advice, as per my, my outline earlier, they need advice. So how do they reintroduce this, this, this advice space? Which I think is, is an important part. Because those, those are, it's probably a, a very, very high level perspective of, of, of the country. Is there more to be done? I think yes. Because you, you think about blockchain, you think about the use cases of artificial intelligence, you think about the metaverse, what, what all these can contribute to, to the retirement space. But I think we probably can have a separate uh, session on just those topics. Yeah. And I was thinking, if you look on the investment side, there's a big debate now, I think, across the world that pension funds should invest more in their own country and also more in illiquid assets and particularly private equity to kind of help the economy to grow. So you're sort of part of the economy and you support it. And this is a story that I hear in, in France, I hear it in the UK, you hear it in the Netherlands, you hear it coming up in Sweden. Um, so it, it, and it seems to be universal uh, because with the shortage of money and, you know, governments, think it's a good idea that pension funds could take more an active role. But when you look around in the different countries, what have you seen? What does this work? Where does it work or where does it not work? What are sort of the critical factors for it to be successful? I think it's a good question. Maybe let me break, break the question into three answers or three components. Number one, I think I mentioned, mentioned the IFC study early on. One of the outcomes that we did that we only focused on, on, on middle income countries but you saw very clearly a macroeconomic spillover effect. And in very simple terms, I'm not an economist, so I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm describing this, this as a layman only, but in very simple terms, you have money accumulated from, from funded retirement systems, private retirement systems, that flow into a domestic capital market. For example, a good example is, is a place like Australia, Chile are some, some really good examples. Even the United States, one could argue, is a good example of that. You have this risk capital that flows in, in, into the domestic market and it, it needs to find a home, it needs to find investment returns and therefore people do, drive innovation and bring it to good use. And this in turn then give, builds jobs which then in, and, and drive health, better health outcomes by, by to drive better, better housing outcomes. And then in turn, that in, in, in turn drives socioeconomic growth which builds an engine to increase contributions yet, yet again. And so that becomes a self-fulfilling circle. I think that's sort of the very simplistic uh, uh, outline from, from an economics perspective. I think most of us, us probably start with the supposedly Canadian model, that having spent many years in Australia and called Australia home, the, it's probably a Canadian slash Australian model, but I let others fight that out because the Australians have, have done that in a very, very similar way, probably not as, as visible as, as, as the, the Canadians. But in, in terms of, of, of this, the, the very, very clear good case studies of a variety of different organizations, and I can't, I can't name one in particular, but given that you're Toronto-based, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, that has really shown how these additional extra returns build long-term value additional value that you don't generate otherwise. And I think Keith Embershare is a, is a great guru in, in the pension space. He's actually done some analysis in, in, in this space. And if I'm not mistaken, hopefully I'm not citing him wrong, 
But I think he concluded that these direct investments can generate up to, to 30 basis points sustainable outperformance through, through this space. So is there, is there a value? Absolutely, there is a, is, is a value, value. The Australians have shown this, the Canadians have, have shown this, and a couple of, of, of the, the probably less known sovereign wealth funds around the world have very, very clearly shown this. So I think that's sort of the second answer. The third answer, maybe we can dwell on that a little bit more, more with some follow-ups, is very, very many organizations trying to copy. And unfortunately, copying this is pretty hard because most organizations, unfortunately, can't pay the salaries. They can't or struggle to pay the salaries, particularly for, for public organizations that are in the spotlight. They often struggle and they, they focus far, far too much on, in, in my humble view, on investment fees rather than net outcomes, net sustainable outcomes. And therefore, most organizations, and there's some really good material out, out there on, on the web where you see, for example, the pay scale of different organizations. What can, can for, for example, certain American organizations, public pension plans pay their chief investment officers and their, their investment staff compared to what the Canadians can pay, compared to what private organizations can pay. There is a cultural element in, in, in here because you can't just switch on and say, now I'm a player. You need to be able to have investment governance in here. You need to be able to make these informed decisions. You need to be able to have the infrastructure, the capabilities. And most organizations that I've personally seen is unfortunately have not really built this muscle of, of investments and therefore to a large degree, we just simply struggle to keep up uh, with where many of these are going. But by saying that, I'm going to pause there in a second, is a lot are trying on this journey. Yeah, and uh, as you say, it requires some, it's not for everyone. You need to know what you're doing and invest accordingly. Mm. Because if you don't, you might actually end up not getting what you hoped for. So I think that's something for every organization to think about. What do you want? What can you do? And what are you able to do in your context? Uh, I think before we open it up for, for questions from the audience, I see we do have a couple of them. I was wondering to you, if you're like working in the industry, working in a, in a pension fund, what are the key questions you think we should ask ourselves um, when we sort of trying to improve what we're doing? I think probably if we break this down maybe onto, onto three levels in really thinking about what are the questions we should ask on a country level, on a provider level, on, on an individual level. I think that's, that's how I personally always think about from, a, from an ecosystem perspective. What are some of the, the, the key questions? Is, I said the, the, the study that, that I mentioned earlier with, 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 the, with the IFC sort of brings out a variety of different success criteria. Probably about 80% of them, we all know there's nothing, nothing new about that. So let's, be, let's be, be very, very clear around this. But from a, from a country perspective, to me, there's, there's probably two or three elements that I find, find very, very, very important to, for us to ask. And the most important part is, what is our long-term vision that we as a country have? What is that we communicate about the retirement system? and about being social. And what is it that we then act upon to get there and get there in a straight line? And I think what I mean by, by that in particular is what is your, the country's ability to make some of the tough, the tough questions? Because we all know Rome has not been built in one day. So be, being able to build all of this in, in, in one day does not work. And I don't expect, expect that my, my two-year-old son many, many years ago to ride a bicycle. Now, last week, he managed to get his, his, his uh, theoretical driving test. So, yes, he's going to drive a car at some point. But that is because it's age appropriate. So really being able to look at, at what, are the, the, what is the discipline of making tough decisions. And I think associated with that is how do we manage people's expectations? There's some really interesting case studies that we found out, for example, in a place like Chile, and in other countries where people were all very, very gung-ho about, about the pension system in, in Chile, and it is good. But 20, 30 years ago, people probably did not necessarily 
manage expectations that if you have a, a middle income country that has middle income salaries, you're not going to get a, 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 a high end, high income countries retirement outcomes. Because for, for at least half of your, your life mathematically, you only have middle income contributions. So really managing expectations because those expectations create to me trust. So how does how do we build trust on, 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 on country level? So I think that's to me to, to me probably one of the, the key questions. How can we build that? And then on individual level, how can we help these people to actually focus not just on product? Because to me, one of the, 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 the fascinating things that I see all around the world, we are fascinated by products. Whether it's a my super in Australia or CDC, uh, and, and I was, I was comment, commenting yes, yesterday on a LinkedIn post of a good friend in Germany, and they were inviting to an event like this. And I had to read three times uh, a paragraph about, about th this size, five lines, because they were throwing so many acronyms at, at, at me in terms of, of technical jargon that we all deal with. So how can we focus on outcomes rather than products for the individual? Because the individual, and I always, always, always say, say that to my team, most members, most savers, don't have a primary need for a retirement product. They want to have fun in retirement. So what we are building is we're building a tool for them in terms of pensions or of, of retirement income or annuities that give them the financial means to adequately then have fun to go play golf or have vacations or look after children and, and, and whatever. So really being able to tilt from product into outcomes. That to me is, is, is really the, 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 the key point. And then maybe coming back to our introduction conversation, for all of us, think about culture. How much of, of our decisions, whether it's, it's being on the board or whether it's being an executive or, or being a product manager or being a pol policy maker as a regulator, how much of, of, of my decisions are, is influenced by culture. How much of my blind spots do exist based on my culture? How much of my priorities? And how can I actually better identify those to make better decisions, but also understand where the other person comes from? I think those are, are, are to me, probably some of the most important elements. And maybe last point is thinking about one thing. Retirement requires one big aspect time because we all talk about contributions contributions need to take a long time 40 years to contribute and we talk about compound interest compound interest needs time because it needs time to, to actually do its magic i think those are, are, are to me some of the really key, key elements that I, I personally always always try to drive hard for all of us to focus on because we get very, very, very focused. And I think there's, I've recently heard, heard a very fascinating uh, quote that I remember uh, so vividly and, and, and tried to reflect myself. I think people associate that with, with people from Florida. I'm not sure whether that's true. But it, it goes a, a, along the lines of if you're fighting an alligator, you actually forget that the reason why you're there was in the first place to, to drain the swamp. So we always get fascinated by the current conversation around what do we need to change in a political in, in a pension system right now in a retirement system right now. But the actual purpose that we quite often forget is how do we build better long-term outcomes for all the different stakeholders, but particularly for for the members. Thank you, and I think yeah, one important part there, which I think we all should bring with us, is is the culture because we are colored by our own views what is possible or not so sometimes it's good to step outside your comfort zone and challenge your own cultural mm -hmm. convictions we're going to jump over now to questions and we have quite a lot of them in the chat so we have to be quite efficient joe when addressing them so the first one comes from david bird it says i enjoyed your answer about mandatory participation you described that solving the participation leads to focus 
leads the focus to be elsewhere. He, he compared with a fairground game, whack-a-mole, and the most what which is the most important aspect of pensions to mandate, or where is it not possible? <laughs> I, I would, I'm not sure there is just one. Because what we've seen, I'll give you two examples. I think the first one, and we've debated this in Australia for many, many years. I had fierce debates uh, with, with other folks in the UK around this. Is the first question is, is you need to participate. So if you would, would give me a, 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 the, the, the privilege of ordering it rather than picking one, I would say the most important part is you need to participate. Because if you don't participate, everything else is, 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 is is, is just a purpose to, to debate. So mandation on participation, in my view, has the biggest, it's, it's the most important part. But then the second part, and we've seen this in, that was my example early on with the UK, is mandation and enabling me to make informed decision, enabling me if I want to have choices with quality of advice, is absolutely crucial. Because you can see very, very clearly that some countries are struggling, People are struggling with that decision to move into decumulation. What is the best product? And mandatory saying, I need to have this product alone. I'm not sure that it's going to work because the, the diversity of, of individuals with what they want to do in their life during retirement is way, way more complex than, uh, than being able, able to, to standardize the contribution during the, the, the working phase. So I think being fully agreed, yeah. I fully yeah, agree yeah. with that. And I, I, I typically say that when you're young, from a pension perspective, everybody is more or less the same. And when you're getting close to retirement, we're all very different. Absolutely. John has a question here. He says, Nest and the US auto IRAs have chosen a mandate with a participant opt-out. Is that the best of both worlds? I think it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I think when you look at the numbers of, of Nest, when you look at the numbers of this, the state IRA programs, they all run somewhere in the high 90s in terms of, of stickiness. I would boldly say, say that is probably as good as mandation, as good as, or in, in, in the same realm. But I don't think, and I think we may, may, may mentioned that in our introduction, is copying what one country has done into another country is very, very, very dangerous. So being able to, to say, opt-out will work as the second and is the best of both worlds globally i'm not sure it's, is is the right answer but it's definitely it high up high up in, in 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 that space of solving the participation question but similarly coming back to my earlier point both have only solved one problem participation and i think both in my humble view should think about the other four questions, uh, other four, four mandatory components that, that I mentioned in, in, in terms of focusing on, on advice, focusing on governance, focusing on, on long-term strategy, because none of those countries do have that. Yeah, I think that's a good advice, actually. And I've, when you also implement something like that, you spend a lot of time and energy doing it. So then I say it's difficult to pick up the more the other four questions, which are also more complicated because there's no straightforward solution to them, I guess. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Chris here. He says, some interesting perspectives, thanks. The key challenge remains how to convince the young, particularly those with the family responsibilities, to save for the future, which is 20, 30, 40 years, when they are struggling to make ends meet in the current economic circumstances. Have you any thoughts on this, please? Yeah, it's a, some interest, interesting. I'll I, I give you an example. I, I, I spent a bit of time in, 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 in India and, and with, with, with folks in, in, in Sri Lanka. And, and what, one of the senior executives shared with me a story around how you focus on micro pensions. There's a fascinating process around. And we're talking people who are struggling to actually make ends meet. They're really struggling. So they're not struggling on a, on a, on a high level. They really have, have minimal level of income. And what people have really been able to do is to convince them by helping them to change their behaviors 
with very, very small changes. And I think what they've been, been able to do, and I've, I've, I've recently been, been involved in, in, in a project in Africa, very, very similar story. We're talking people who literally have nothing to eat or they, they are living day by day, not paycheck by paycheck. They're living day by day and some of, some of the days there is no food on the table. So we're not talking about the poverty levels that we have in most Western societies. We are talking about people struggling for survival. And with these people, they've been, been able to engage them early, have been able to educate them. And the fascinating thing is, and sorry, that sounds very discriminatory, educating girls is way, way more, more beneficial in this process than educating men. Because the girls, at least in these environments, uh, that ch changing that their education and helping them to understand the, the value of savings actually has, has made tremendous uh, impact. But I think what I'm try, trying to say here is, is there's always the, the, the way of mandation of, of the young. But I think the second best is to really help them to give, give solutions that are easy, that are convenient, that fit into their world. Because, and I think one of the things I would, I would highly recommend to have a look at for those of you who are interested is California has, has implemented CalSavers as one of those state IRA programs. And there is a fascinating analysis on, on which organizations in California don't have, have a 401k plan. And about half of them are not the organizations that, that we think. Those are the organizations, Silicon Valley, high-end people with high-end amount of income that just find that all of us are so boring and complicated that they just don't want this to have in their organization. As I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally uh, polarizing my, my, my point here a little bit too much. But I think the, the key point here is engaging the young. We need to find where they are. And when you think about how organizations, and I'm not promoting any, anyone in particular, but all of, all of you guys are, are probably spend, spending a, a ton of time on, on, on a shopping platform that is, 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 is named after, after a river, river in, in, in Brazil. And a lot of you, you guys spend, spend time on different social media uh, outlets. Most of the young are on these mechanisms. So we need to find not all traditional things that work for all of us. We need to find mechanisms to engage with that generation where they are. And in my humble view, we're doing a pretty, pretty poor job on this. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of things we can do in communicating better. And uh, I think as an industry, we, we do lag a bit behind, I think. This. So that means there's a lot of opportunity for innovation. Uh, John has a question here, a comment to, to Chris' question, talking about Singapore, where you actually combine housing and all other things in one big uh, obligatory savings plan. Is that a way forward, or is it more going to water out your savings because you, as it, you end up consuming the money, and when it's time to retire, you might not have so much left? What's your kind of view on it? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm on the record for about ten years. I've, I've written a publication about ten years ago on uh, that included uh, my, my take on what I call financial well-being, and it probably comes from from spending a ton of my my life in distribution and, and organization and financial services. And I think as, as such, we, we, we crafted the, the, the term financial well-being, not wellness. I think the US call it wellness. But it's really thinking about what are the key questions that, that most individuals have uh, when, when in, in, in preparation of, of, of their retirement. But also today, it boils down to about eight or nine questions. But to simply, simplify, it's about wealth, including retirement. It's about health, health care, health insurance, how much can, can I afford? Because we all know that, that we spent most of our healthcare costs in the last three to five years of, of, of our life. But then it's all about happiness. And I think what, what, we, what we've personally seen is, is uh, we've, we've done a number of, of, of programs with a few organizations. For those of you who, who want to really have, have an innovative look, have a look at, at the Employee Provident Fund in, in, in Malaysia has done a tremendous job on this. Is really embracing these different com components. And really thinking about how can I help you with all of them? And in a modern day environment, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to manufacture each of those components. But when I look at, and, and Singapore has, has done that, is that Malaysia has also had these, 
these type of options for many, many years where you can withdraw money for a certain purpose. And yes, you're going to potentially missing out later on uh, in, in during the retirement phase, but you have a house, you have education, and in most cases, people will do this anyway. So by giving them these so, so-called, I think the UK uh, called them sidecars, these sidecars have been in existence in, in, in many parts of, of, of Asia for many years. They're not an, an, an innovation. You actually help people to embrace and trust. And I give, give, you, give you one, 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 one in, insight as part of this, this project we, we I mentioned early on, where we talked to top executives in, in Chile. And Chile went through, I think, three rounds of withdrawals during COVID. And the, the key element was, yes, it, 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 it has massive implications on, on less, less retirement income, uh, account balances available. But what all of these people said to me is, people always had for many, many years, did not know where the money was there and was, that, was, was in existence and was theirs. What these three withdrawals have achieved is a absolutely unique boost of trust. And I, I said, I'm, I'm not trying to promote these withdrawals because I think they, they were probably necessary, necessary at the time. But to go back to your question, is being able to take money out for housing. And then let's be clear, putting money back in. So you don't just pull it out and then, then leave it. In most, most cases, you're obliged to, to put the money back in later. But it's way, way more tax efficient. I'll give you another example, which we very, very rarely talk about. The pension fund in the Philippines do exactly that. So some, the, 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 the pension, two, two of the pension funds in, in, in the Philippines are huge lenders. So you actually go to them to a large degree rather than go to, go to the bank because it's way cheaper. And it's your money. And people then have a, have a payment plan, very similar to a loan, pay back the money. So I'm a big fan of, 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 of these mechanisms for a very simple reason. They align to my needs, my outcomes, not individual products, as I mentioned before, but to outcomes. And actually, I remember from when I started to work in the Dutch, oh, in the in the Sweden on, on a life insurance company, they did have uh, mortgages and stuff. And they do still have in Iceland. And I think it sort of went away because the bank thought it was unfair competition. But so it's something that has been around for a while also in the Western world, but sort of disappeared. No, yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite fascinating, Stefan, is when you look at, and maybe talking a little bit out of, out of school from, from strategy projects with some large financial institutions, is a lot of this stuff is coming back through modern ecosystems. Because all of these organizations are, are, are realizing the customer perspective is what counts. And how can I actually engage you as a customer? And with modern day technology in, 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 in place or coming, coming in many of those organizations quickly, you can actually now go back and think about, I give you that mortgage. I, I, I give you a, a retirement home. And if you want to have a gold version, you go, you go here in the US, you go to Arizona. If you want to have a, a, a silver version, you go, you go to Florida. And I think there's a lot of, of, of these type of models. A lot of this you can see China is substantially way more advanced, but there's also some really good examples coming out of France and a few other places on this. So I will not discount this. And now we have time for the final question here before you even have the chance to ask a question. And that's from David. He says, interesting answer about illiquid and home investments. With what you know about the UK, what do you think about the recent Mansion House uh, uh, initiative? <laughs> uh, I'm sure that's going to be interpreted politically. I'm not a voter in the UK for disclosure. I speak out of my, 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 my own observation. I, I think number one, I think we talked about that, Stefan, early on. Does it make sense for, for pension funds to invest in, in infrastructure, in housing, in private markets? I think there's probably very, very few people who would, would argue that case. So I think on that front, what Mention House has, ha, has, has done is I think makes a ton of conceptual sense. 
has it, and I think that goes goes to the second part of, of what I've mentioned earlier is most countries and governments have not really implemented from A to Z. Because to me, part of it is having been a trustee myself in, in my past life is how does this sort of almost encouragement or mandate align with my my authority, my my fiduciary duty to make investment decisions myself, not being instructed by a government. I think that is something I, I'm not sure that that has really been sorted out. But it does it doesn't conceptually make, make a ton of sense. The answer is yes, because if I first look at my Australian superannuation fund that I have still, they own a ton of 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 UK assets. So what, and they have a big big office in 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 London to do all of these investments, not just in London but across across Europe. So having UK pension funds invest makes to me a ton of sense. Now the question comes back to 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 your your point earlier on, Stefan. Do they have the right level of expertise, the right level of scale uh, to to be able to do all of this? Question mark. I'm not going to jump jump to an answer here. Uh, but to, to me, I think conceptually it makes a ton of sense, but I think there's probably way, way more, more things around that have not been answered in my view. Thank you, Joe. And now, now you've been very nice, kind answering all our questions. And so now it's time for you to ask a question to the next speaker. And the next speaker is Alfred Slacher. He's a professor at the TIAS uh, Business School in Tilburg, and he's also a board member of many pension funds and sitting in investment committees. So he sees both the academic side and the practitioner side, and his focus is on governance and how to sort of make better decisions. And he will come on October 23rd, so it's a Monday, it's another type of day, and it's 2 p.m. UK time. So, Joe, what do you want to ask Alfred? I think it's a very good question. I think governance has been one of my hobby horses for quite some time. But when I look around the world, we use this word, word loosely. We think we talk about the same thing, but it means different things to different people. The same on investment governance. Uh, and I think to me, when, it, when you think about what, what all of these things contribute, why do we care? Those components, whether it's, it's governance or investment governance, the topic that we have not talked about is industry governance, create trust. And the question I, I would really ask is, given that, that, that we ha have you use this word globally, but it means different things to different people, how do we create a, a universal, meaningful definition of this that is then consistently applied and I think, how do we make sure that we create this implementation to what I call commensurate? Because a lot of people are implementing governance, having investment governance in place that may or may not be commensurate to the importance and complexity of, of this tool. And when I look at some of the pension funds, they are more systemic risks if they make bad decisions than many large banks. So how do we how do we expand the commensurate level of governance and create a universal perspective of this topic uh, on both investment governance, uh, corporation governance, but also industry governance ar ar around the world? Thank you, Joe. I think I'm really looking forward to hear Alfred's answer on that question. And I would like to thank you, Joe, for coming and participating and sharing your knowledge and experience with all of us here in the room. And I also would like to thank everyone in the audience for coming and, and participating and particularly asking your questions. And with that, I would like to say once again, thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure to have you here. And I hope to see all of you uh, next month uh, in the next conversation. Until then, have a good time. Enjoy. Thank you.